know, uh, there, there's a lot of folks in the ecosystem, but I'm just curious with, with your, from your vantage point, yeah. um, what's your, your general take and outlook on, on, on the Bitcoin space and maybe just the, the future of, of Bitcoin privacy and, and uh, you know, Bitcoin's relevancy in general, um, I guess, to the first realm, per se. Yeah, I mean, this is generally where I get in trouble, right? Um, because I don't, you know, I'm not a, uh, a Bitcoin idealist. I don't think that, you know, Bitcoin changes the world. And I don't think that uh, uh, just because Bitcoin is there, you know, there, there goes state tyranny. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I got it when I got into Bitcoin. The, the primary reason I got into Bitcoin was for censorship free transactions um for self-sovereignty and a way to route around the legacy system and the fact that a a, a type of money as I, as I thought of it then existed to to route around um, uh, the entrenched um, uh, aspects of the legacy system it was amazing to me and pretty much I would say 90 percent of the people involved at that time were all there for that reason um so privacy was was high on people's radar um censorship free transactions ways of transacting without internet for example in case internet goes down like all of this was all on on everyone's mind and we were all kind of working towards that that end um, within a few years uh you know at least by 20 2015 things had we, the writing on the wall was there for us um we started having a bunch of clowns entering the space it was really more about investment and more about um uh, ultimately having a, a larger fiat stack at the end of it right and i think that totally that totally uh, perverts what this thing is about And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state uh, and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Paznia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, for more information on this physical and digital second realm network under construction, uh, please do visit the newly redesigned uh, and in the works Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com. Uh, now, I don't want to waste any time today as I've been really looking forward to this conversation for uh, at least a few months. Uh, earlier this year, the prospects of Samurai Wallet opened up to me. Uh, that was thanks to the Ghost Phone, uh, the de-Google the, uh, de Pixel 3As with uh, Calyx OS uh, that are now available on the LEO Publications website. And uh, the somewhat recent events with Wasabi Wallet also helped to propel me, uh, propel me down the uh, coin join rabbit hole. Uh, but needless to say, after months of general wallet use and uh, some time with Whirlpools, uh, I have to say uh, this is definitely the Bitcoin wallet uh, for privacy-centric venues. Uh, now I mentioned Whirlpool, but that's only one of the many features uh, that would be attractive to us self-liberators, uh, many of which we'll learn about today uh, with one of the fun, uh, one of the co-founders uh, who goes by uh, at Samurai Wallet on Twitter. Uh, we'll start by learning a bit, a bit about his background and history, uh, as well as that of Samurai. Uh, we'll get a uh, peek into their very cypherpunk uh, Vanu business model. Uh, we'll talk coin joins, Whirlpool, and uh, I guess there's a peer-to-peer -peer coin join function, which I have not had a chance to try yet, which we'll learn all about. Um, other features of the wallet, and uh, yeah, whatever else uh, we happen to stumble on today. So, uh, uh, Samurai, welcome to the Avani uh, Podcast, my friend. Uh, it's a pleasure to be chatting with you. Uh, how are things going? Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, likewise great to be here, and I've been looking forward to this conversation as well since we uh, set it up in on Twitter. <laughs> Fantastic, man. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, I guess the first thing I have to say to you, man, is uh, thank you so much for your tireless dedication to Bitcoin privacy over the years. Uh, I know for me, when I got into into uh, you know so you know so called cryptocurrencies, I had my uh, you know I guess my my time you know uh, you know I guess wasting wasting time and, and a little bit of money per se. Um, but uh, um, and I guess trying trying to find my way towards, I suppose uh, uh, you know through the through all the scams and such. But um, anyway, I. Uh, yeah, big, big into Bitcoin for some time, but I've always kind of, I've always, I've always noticed that there's, there's, uh, there's kind of an issue with privacy, and there wasn't a whole lot of focus on it. Um, so yeah, I looked elsewhere, uh, you know, to Monero and other places, and uh, you know, I, I see a lot of promise in Monero, but I always have really, really bad luck with it. And it's not just one wallet; it's like um, the entire <laughs> ecosystem. Unfortunately, like I really, really wish yeah. it would work well for me, and it does for some people, and that's great. But um, I guess uh, um, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, 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 to getting really deep into uh, Bitcoin privacy. So. Um, yeah, uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, you and uh, what you do, and then maybe some insight on your background and into how you got here? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, I started Samurai Wallet uh, with my uh, co-founder T Dev D uh, in 
early uh, 2015, uh, February 2015. Uh, both of us had been in the Bitcoin space for um, about three years already. And we both had been working full time in the Bitcoin space, earning Bitcoin uh, as, a, uh, as a salary and had gone full on into Bitcoin very early. Um, and, and not just uh, acquiring Bitcoin, but, you know, working for it, spending it, transacting in it. Mm -hmm. And we both at the same, around the same time, had the same kind of concerns uh, that Bitcoin privacy wasn't being focused on nearly enough. Mm -hmm. Then the, the overwhelming uh, narrative was changing from a, a narrative of self-sovereignty uh, to one of uh, get rich quick. And we didn't like yeah. that. Uh, so, you know, instead of just bitching and, you know, going somewhere else, maybe an altcoin or, or something else, we decided, well, let's do something about it. Let's put all our energy and our focus and our experience that we've gained thus far in the space to good use and let's build our own wallet. So Samurai Wallet started there. It was really just a passion project. Uh, it really was, we were building a, a suite of software primarily for ourselves and our use case which was transacting uh and doing so in a in as private a manner as possible uh so that's i mean that's how samurai started and um we basically have not taken our foot off the gas since then we've just been going uh have a steady vision of um on-chain bitcoin privacy and we'll, we'll do everything we can to to reach those goals. And we think we've been doing a good job of hitting those goals. And we think that um, Bitcoin privacy today is in a much better place than when we started. Uh, but by no means is it, you know, the finish line. There's still plenty of work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's what I was trying to get to rambling earlier on is that like you've had, yeah, you're, you've, you've been dedicated for a long time and it's been very, very focused dedication when a lot of, a lot of other folks, you know, got distracted and other things. So, um, that's, uh, that's, that's really incredible. Mm -hmm. So I guess, um, the, the first question I know a lot of, a lot of listeners will have is, you know, like privacy and Bitcoin don't seem like they should be in the same, in the same sense to a lot of people. So I guess, uh, could you, t cause, and, and I guess I had to change my, my, pers my, my perspective on, on Bitcoin privacy a little bit. Um, I guess, could, could you talk to, you know, how, how do you gain privacy on the Bitcoin blockchain, you know, on chain? Um, I guess, what are some of the tools and some of the, some of the obstacles per se? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so right from the, the very start, we all understood and, and realized that, that, um, natively Bitcoin isn't a private network by its very nature. It's a public network and everything is visible. Um, Satoshi realized this and has plenty of, um, writings on it. What uh, he, he Satoshi's gamble or Satoshi's bet was that it's not that big of a deal because it's a pseudonymous system, right? You can see everything that's going on, but you can't necessarily associate uh, a Bitcoin address to an identity uh, in the real in the real world. And and this is still true today of uh, Bitcoin when you're just talking about the blockchain and and the you know the underlying uh, network. However. Um, as things have progressed uh, from those early days. And the emphasis has, again, as I mentioned previously, gone from self-sovereignty to um, uh, get rich quick or number go up or whatever you want to call it. The, the tolerance for um, KYC and AML creeping its way into Bitcoin has, you know, the, the toler there, there's high tolerance for it. People, users will very happily give over you know, a scan of, of their ID or passport, them holding it, the proof of address, all, all the information, you know, that, <laughs> that um, mm -hmm. exists in the, um, you know, the existing paradigm has made its way into Bitcoin. So Satoshi's idea of, of privacy through pseudo, uh, pseudonymity uh, is kind of broken in that regard. Now, you know, for those of us who will avoid KYC and AML like the plague, uh, and I, I account, uh, I'm one of those people, my, my mm -hmm. co-founder is one of those people and many Samurai wallet users are those people. Um, they still do have a, a pretty good, um, level of privacy when they use Bitcoin. Um, it's really about the, the broader market who, who does it. Um, and the, the, the thing is all of the tools that we've built, all the software that we've built, you know, really it can't 
it can't thwart KYC and AML uh, because that's something that you as a user choose to, mm -hmm. to provide service providers. You, you choose to give up that information and privacy, the best definition of privacy is the ability to selectively reveal information about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're selectively re <laughs> revealing, you know, an enormous amount of information about yourself to your counterparties, then you really don't have a lot of um, uh, hope for, for privacy on chain. Um, you know, that being said, so I always like to make it clear to, to our users, because uh, a, lo a lot of the new ones will come in and say, okay, I, I bought this off an exchange, I'm going to whirlpool it, and I'm going to be private now. And I like to just kind of take a step back and say, all right, you're going to have forward-looking privacy, right? You're not going to be able to tie your, your whirlpool coins to your exchange coins, but your counterparty where you bought those coins knows you bought those coins. They know who you are mm -hmm. and they know that you entered Whirlpool. They might not be able to see what's going on after that, but they know that about you. And, you know, there's nothing at this current time that's illegal or unlawful about doing that, but things change really quick. And if you get a knock on the door from a federal agent or an IRS agent and they say, hey, we know you bought this amount and we know you put it into Whirlpool, show us where it went. 99.999% of people are going to show them exactly where it went, right? Because you don't tangle with those guys. If they're in, if you're on their radar, you know, you, that's something you can't win. Uh, so the, the whole game is not being on the radar, yep. right? And the, the biggest issue with KYC AML is you're, you're literally putting yourself on the radar and no one is coercing you into doing it. You're doing it. You're choosing to do it. So, um, it's important. So, to when we to, to answer your question, when we're thinking about privacy, it's important to understand that you have these external applications uh, using exchanges, using services that require uh, invasive KYC and AML information, and you have using the the blockchain. You can obtain basic privacy and and actually decent privacy using the Bitcoin blockchain, but um, if your on ramp and your off ramp is a regulated KYC entity. You kind of undo a lot of uh, a lot of the work <laughs> to, yeah. to stay private. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, and it's it's kind of that's. I'm not sure if you're if you're familiar with there was. Uh, I guess it was maybe maybe end of last year. There was a uh, free keen of the Free State Project in New Hampshire. They had uh, there was a I guess a group of a group of folks who um, they set up you know um, you know legal interest ICs that you know set up a corporation and you know, run a Bitcoin exchange and all. And uh, they you know they're on you know federal trial for the you know the uh, the money. I guess I guess to be the money yep. transmitter thing. But um, money transmission, I guess, yeah. I guess what I, the, the reason I bring that up is, um, you know, what you're talking about with, you know, like volunteering all this information to exchanges. It's like you're turning yourself over to, you know, the pr people you're trying to defend yourself against, um, you know, allegedly. So, yep. um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely right there with you. And uh, I guess um, one thing I want to I want to make sure to get to that I, that I had my outline here. This is this is great so far. Um, but uh, I guess even going going for further than you know what you know what Samurai offers also the, the business model too. I heard you talk about this in one of your podcasts too. Um, kind of you know living this this model of security. Um, would you mind talking a little, little bit about? So I think there was uh, the to, the setup was uh, there was uh, those 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 prospective laws in the UK, and so you guys you know picked up and, and you know picked up shop and, and moved. Um, it's very very much in the realm of you yeah. know um, Vaughn. It was all about mobility, um, and in this in this in this you know time and age, it's all about international mobility. So um, I respect that, and that's very Absolutely. much more much more aligned with Vaughn, which is one reason I resonated with you over the uh, I guess over your so called which I don't even really really consider consider them competitors anymore, really. But um, versus mm -hmm. what they did, you know, I guess uh, um, solidifying themselves in, in a jurisdiction even such as that. So I guess could you talk a little bit about uh, you know how yeah. I guess how Samurai um, works, the whirlpool, uh, so I guess some of your operational security stuff that you are that you're obviously um, able to discuss, um, et cetera. Yeah, sure. I mean, right from the, the very beginning, we elected to not create a corporate entity. Um, we elected to, to keep everything as um, non-traditional as possible. Uh, so when we created Samurai as a quote unquote entity, um, we intended to run it as a, as a business because we believe that in order to create a, um, a project or product with longevity, uh, you know, there has to be a profit uh, motive and it's the best way to get, um, feedback from your users, right? If your users are, are willing to spend, 
uh, their hard-earned Bitcoin on what you're offering, then you're probably offering something that's working for them. Uh, if they're not, then it's a good good way to to realize that and uh, you know kind of reassess. Uh, but we didn't want to have a business bank account. We didn't want to create you know a, a, an entity somewhere. And part uh, partly because we wanted to. Uh, well, one, we, we didn't really know how successful we were going to be with it, but also we wanted to have flexibility and mobility, as you mentioned. Um, I, at the time, was based in the UK. Uh, so the the potential or the, um, the laws that were being discussed at that time that you reference um, would have made it illegal to offer Samurai Wallet uh, to users, so non-custodial. Um, uh, so, uh, wallet software to users. Now that that ended up not not um, uh, being enacted in the final law, um, but the, the, just the very fact that it was discussed and debated that was that was enough for us. We're like, okay, we see. You know, it's in, it didn't end up in this law, but the next iteration it will mm -hmm. be. Um, so you know, we uh, removed all operations that we had in the UK uh, away from there. And then I, I eventually moved away from the UK when the uh, lockdowns happened because I was not happy about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, you know, as for Wasabi, um, so if your listeners don't know, uh, what you're referencing is the fact that Wasabi made a statement, uh, what was it, a couple months ago now, that they would um, be implementing blacklists um, and, you know, determining who and who could and couldn't enter into their mixing pools. Um, they tried initially to say that this was a result of legislation in Hungary where they're based. Um, but, you know, we knew that wasn't true at all because we keep a very, very close eye on the legislation uh, and, and even proposals all around the world. And there was no chatter about, you know, uh, the requirement to implement blacklists, especially for non-custodial software like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so we knew that was that was BS. And then within a couple of days, they admitted that was BS. They were doing it proactively. Um, so, you know, the, it's not a it's not the fact that they're a, a, a registered company or the fact that they're in Hungary. It's just the leadership over there decided that they wanted to, pro, uh, you know, preemptively comply with regulations that don't exist and in our view it's just it's it's a it's a way to build a regulatory moat uh, around um coordinated coin joins you know so they can say hey look we have this you know regulated coordinated coin join and those guys over there meaning samurai don't uh we're obviously the model so they can go and lobby legislators the european union all of this stuff uh to to get laws written that would you know, put us out of business, which would be really nice for them. But, you know, we're not, we have no, <laughs> we have no um, presence in the EU. Mm -hmm. And we frankly don't give a shit what the EU has to say. So we're, we're not going anywhere. Um, uh, uh, coordinated coin joins will continue. There is, will be no blacklist in Samurai um, in, in Whirlpool or anything like that. And um, that's just as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's that's amazing, man. That's amazing, and uh, um, yeah, I'm I'm glad you provided that overview. We haven't really, I haven't really had a chance to talk too much about it. It, it got brought up in the second realm assembly when, um, uh, by one of our one of our folks. But um, but anyway, um, that's uh, like yeah, to, to give a to give a concrete kind of uh, example of one of the things we did when we first started. Uh, as I mentioned, we wanted we saw it as a business or a potential business, and um, you know, one of the ways one of the things you do when you set up a a registered entity or company um, is you assign, you know, equity or membership interest if it's an LLC and say, oh, well, I have 50% and you have 50%. Um, and we weren't able to do that uh, through normal conventional mechanisms because we didn't create the company. Uh, but what we were able to do was use the counterparty network, which was still kind of new at that time, uh, which is if, you, if your listeners are unfamiliar, it's kind of like a, uh, a it's not a side chain, but you can think of it as a side chain to Bitcoin. So it uses the Bitcoin blockchain, but you're able to like create these uh, assets on there. So we created an asset called Samurai and said, yeah, there's a hundred thousand units of this. You can't increase it or decrease it. And I have 50,000 and you have 50,000. Therefore I have 50% and you have 50%. Uh, so we were, we were basically able to 
track equity in the the entity without having and, and having it on a immutable ledger uh, thanks to the Bitcoin blockchain um, without having to go the traditional route. So that's like an example for your listeners as as a way we were able to kind of uh, achieve the same kind of um, thing that you need when you create an entity, but do so on the blockchain as opposed to, you know, a state, you know, a state run uh, a corporation. Yeah. Or state sanctioned corporation, I should say. Yeah, they're they're always solutions. Uh, they're always solutions. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's great to hear too. So um, I guess we've been we've been talking for yeah for, for about twenty minutes. We've gotten a little bit into the wallet, but um, I guess uh, um, yeah, let's let's start talking about uh, you know about this this incredible tool. Um, so people, you know, they da they download this on their ghost phone. Let's say, um, uh, can you can you talk a little bit about uh, the the setup? I know the um, it took it took a little bit of getting used to for me the pre and post mix wallets. Um, so yeah, could you sure. just give us a little yeah. bit of introduction and a walkthrough of what people can expect? Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think we've done a good job of making, um, Samurai simple to use if, you know, you, you don't really have a lot of experience or knowledge just by the basic defaults of the wallet, you're going to obtain a level of privacy that you're really not going to get from any other wallet without having to do anything in particular. So. Uh, if your your listeners are kind of a, on the newer side to Bitcoin or newer side of Bitcoin privacy, uh, they don't need to be uh, overwhelmed when they use Samurai Wallet. You can start real slow, just because out the gate you're going to get a lot of protections that you're just not getting anywhere else. Um, as you learn, read, experiment, use, um, you may decide that you want to use Whirlpool CoinJoin, and one of the most important things about CoinJoin. Um, is not linking the um, the mixed coins to the unmixed coins in your wallet because doing so can have dramatic privacy consequences. Uh, and in most CoinJoin implementations, there are no protections for the user that would link those um, unmixed coins to mixed coins. It can happen very, very easily in most wallets. Well, in, in Samurai Wallet, it can't happen. It's impossible. And you you uh, allude to this with the pre-mix and the post-mix uh, coins. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a thing to get used to. But um, essentially what we do is when you mix your coins, anything that doesn't get mixed, that can't be mixed, goes back to the unmixed coins section of the wallet while anything that has been mixed goes to a completely different section of the wallet. And you can't combine those two sections of the wallet. Um, UX wise, it's maybe is a little clunky, uh, but we're getting uh, with a, a numerous updates throughout the rest of this year. We'll make that a lot more streamlined for people, I think. But overall, um, actually performing the coin join, it's very simple. I mean, you can do it right, everything on your mobile phone uh, you can do it on your desktop if you want, um, but it, it, you essentially say, hey, I have this many uh, UTXOs or Bitcoin in my, my wallet and I want to put them into Whirlpool. You choose which ones you want to put in, choose um, which pool you want to go in. So we have different size denomination mixing pools, 0 0.01 Bitcoin, 0 0.05 Bitcoin, 0 0.5 Bitcoin, etc. cetera. Um, and from that point, those two choices say, this is what I want to mix. This is where, what pool I want to mix in. The rest is automated. So it's, it's really straightforward. It's really simple. And it's the, the strongest coin join, uh, on the market to date. Um, completely, uh, no, no deterministic links, free remixing. So you, you get compounding privacy, um, at no additional cost. We're really proud of it. And I think the market is, is speaking. Uh, where we have multiple wallets now coming to us and saying, hey, we want to implement Whirlpool into our wallet. And to us, that's like huge. That That's that's just reaffirming that this is a really good protocol. It's a really good platform. And the first uh, external third-party wallet to actually implement Whirlpool in, in its entirety is Sparrow Wallet, uh, which is a desktop wallet, which is an excellent desktop wallet, I should mention. Um, so it's really nice to see the um, the wider ecosystem uh, starting to notice Whirlpool and build it into their own product, and we're re we're really proud of that. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's uh, that's that's amazing to hear, man. That's amazing to hear. Um, yeah, like I said, I've, I've been using it for for a number of months. I uh, can attest to, um, you know, it, it's it's very very user friendly. It's just it's it's really just getting used to the new, um, I guess the the new privacy features per se. Like like you're talking about the pre and post mix wallets. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Really, just just looking around, you can you can get a feel for things. But there was one well, there's one part of the wallet, um, that was uh, interesting. Um, there, I guess it'd be the unspent outputs, the, I guess the toxic change per se. Um, yeah. I guess, uh, um, you, uh, you want to, I, I guess, could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, sure. So, so the toxic change, um, again, is referring to that small bit of Bitcoin that cannot go into a mixing pool, right? So I, I mentioned that we have uh, four different denomination mixing pools. Uh, the lowest being 0 0.001 and the highest being 0 0.5. Um, what that means is whatever, it doesn't matter any amount you put in to any one of those pools, the, the resulting UTXOs or coins that you get back are going to be of that denomination. So if I put two Bitcoin uh, or I'm sorry, one Bitcoin into the 0 0.5 pool, I'm going to get two UTXOs to unspent outputs of 0 0.5, which makes one Bitcoin. Um, the amount that can't enter a pool, it's too small, uh, is goes back to your main wallet. And this is called toxic change because this UTXO is still connected to the, the past, right? So let's say you bought some coins on Coinbase, you sent them to your Samurai wallet, and then from there you went into Whirlpool. But there was a you know a, a five thousand sat UTXO that couldn't be mixed. That five thousand sat UTXO is still connected to that activity um, where you bought it from Coinbase. It's still connected to that. So we segregate that that coin away from your 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 mixed coins so that you couldn't connect your mixed coins to that coin, which would connect everything together. Um, and it sounds like a no brainer thing and it really is a no brainer thing, but it's shocking that still to this day in, uh, for example, Wasabi wallet version one and version two, there is no, that protection doesn't exist. So you can very, very easily connect your entire mixed coin stash to its past history, to its, what you put in without ever intending to do it, you know, without having, yeah, without making any conscious decisions or anything like that. It just, the wallet will do it on your behalf, which is terrible. It's, it's, it's not good at all. So yeah, that can't happen in Samurai. We do that automatically. We ask you if you want to, you know, make that coin quote unquote unspendable, meaning that the wallet will never use it for anything. And you can make it spendable later on when you decide what you want to do with it. If you want to do anything with it. Um, yeah, so that go, that unspent output um, returns back to your unmixed coin section of the wallet, and then your mixed coins are in a whole segregated section of the wallet. And those coins like have a new a new identity because what CoinJoin is is separating past activity from future activity. Uh, so those coins that you bought from Coinbase can no longer Coinbase can no longer track them. That's basically uh, the simple way of of saying it. Once they're in the whirlpool, they can no longer track it. And if they're hoping that you're using Wasabi so they can track the unmixed change, they can't, you know, that gets stopped at the source in Samurai. Awesome. Awesome. So um, there's, there's other features of Samurai I want to get to, but uh, the toxic change there, I guess there's, um, I'm, I'm getting a new outlook on Monero now. Um, and maybe not necessarily as a, as a, a, a tool for peer to peer for me, cause I don't really spend or receive Monero very much at all. Um, but XMR can definitely be used uh, like as a great tool in, in further cleaning Bitcoin. Um, I was thinking about I've, I've seen people Absolutely. post about this too, so like it's not original to me. But um, like especially with like atomic swaps, uh, you know, decentral, you know, peer-to-peer -peer atomic swaps yep. being possible, um, you can go take that toxic toxic change straight into XMR. Um, I mean, that's just I mean, Absolutely. that's just as good as a coin join, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, I know it's it's excellent, and a lot of a lot of our users do that. Um, the so the issue with that currently is that atomic swaps for Monero to Bitcoin don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tech is being worked on. In fact, we're working on it with, um, well, we were working on it with a, a team on the Monero side. So we were going to do the Bitcoin side of things. They were going to do the Monero side of things. But 
we think that team is kind of dried up now. I don't think they're they're interested in finishing the work they started, but we're definitely still interested. And that's the exact reason why. So many of our users are um, swapping that unmixed change, that toxic, toxic change to Monero, building up a balance in Monero to the point where then they can send, do a swap back into Bitcoin and enter back into Whirlpool. Um, because, you know, we're a Bitcoin wallet. We're not a Monero wallet, right? And our users are Bitcoin users, not primarily Monero users. So they want to be in the, on the Bitcoin network. They don't really want to spend uh, too much time on the Monero network, but using Monero as a obfuscation tool, chain hopping to a very, very private um, blockchain and back uh, is a really good um really good strategy. The issue right now, because they don't have, we don't have a atomic swap capability yet, is that making that swap incurs third party risk, right? You have to use something like coin swap or some other, you know, some other method, uh, which is a centralized. Oh. Okay. Um, you there? Yeah. Yeah. I don't second. know what happened. <laughs> no worries. No worries. That was quick. <laughs> All right. We <laughs> all right uh good to continue <laughs> yes yes we're good yeah all right cool <laughs> um so the the swap currently incurs third-party risk now it might not be for long because you know um uh, coin swap or whatever whatever third party you're using is usually pretty quick uh but there still is third-party risk there uh the atomic swap will take out third-party risk and it will be a peer-to-peer -peer, as you mentioned and that will be uh, much more, uh, much safer for our users. Um, so yeah, there's there's a variety of ways of dealing with uh, unmixed change or, or toxic uh, change, as you call it. And swapping chains is one way. Some users, um, you know, uh, use the Lightning Network, though that comes with a lot of um, asterisks to do so privately. Uh, some users just buy, um, you know. Um, uh, gift cards like on bit refill because bit refill doesn't require a either create an account or anything so you can you can go, use that to buy um you know gift cards for walmart or something like that so there's a lot of very there's various ways people deal with that chain some people just save it up and wait until we create a pool that they can enter with it <laughs> you know it's a a lot of people do different things but yeah uh, you you act, absolutely hit the nail on the head uh, xmr swap for that purpose in particular is a really good use case yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So um, I guess uh, more incredible things about Samurai wallets. I mean, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, breaking deterministic links. And then I guess in the present, you know, when we're spending our Bitcoin currently, we want to um, remove as much personal identifiable information as possible that could be obtained. So um, on that note, you guys, I guess uh, um, there's a setting for it. Um, but um, obviously, I think any new and listening to this podcast would have it on. Uh, but you can route all, all traffic via Tor, uh, which is great. And I also noticed that when you're, Yes. coin joining um every single time you coin join an input you get a new tour identity which is just beautiful um it's yeah. it's just like with calyx os it just flashes your opsec at the top left the entire time um just shows you everything it's like it's it's great i love it um so those are i guess a couple couple things i yeah. I, I can I, that i'm familiar with um but i guess uh, i know there's there's ricochet there's pain ms there's cahoots there's stuff i haven't tried out yet so tell us more about uh, some of these some of these other features Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, so just on tour, um, it's worth noting that, uh, we were the, the first wallet to actually embed tour into the wallet. Uh, prior to that, you had to have like a third party uh, app like Warbot or something like that on. Um, but Samurai was the first to actually build, bundle in tour, uh, into the wallet itself. So even users who don't, um, know about Warbot, don't really know about tour, all they have to do to enable it is just flick a switch and they're in. Um, but yeah, so, you know, yeah, the wallet has a lot of functionality and it's developed over, you know, over the years we've been in development. So the first piece of, I guess, uh, functionality worth highlighting is um, Ricochet. So what Ricochet is designed to do is place hops of history between your coin and the final destination. So why would you use that? Uh, again, let's use Coinbase as an example. Coinbase has a onerous terms and conditions. Maybe you were doing some like online gambling. Maybe you were donating to uh, you know some place that Coinbase disagrees with, and then you go 
use those same coins to deposit into Coinbase to make a sale. Um, there's a very high likelihood that Coinbase will look at that history, say, oh, two hops from us, they made a donation to something we find disagreeable, you know, lock that account. Um, what Ricochet would do is instead of Coinbase having to look only one or two hops back, they would have to look uh, five plus hops back. So I want to send to Coinbase, but first I'm going to do, I'm going to send through Ricochet. It means that those coins are going to go to one address, two address, three address, four address, five address, and then Coinbase. Uh, so it increases the cost of looking back uh, at a transaction. And it may not sound effective, but it's a seriously effective tool. Because if Coinbase has to start looking back seven hops on all of their deposits versus one hop, it's going to impact the them tremendously. A lot. That's good. I like that. Yeah, Absolutely. It it's a huge, huge increase. Yes. And it's such a simple tool. It was actually, um, the concept was first, um, I believe, first discussed by um, Adam Back and Blue Matt. And th I mean, this is years and years ago, uh, 2015 sometime, uh, maybe 2014. And, you know, we, we there, it was a talk that they were doing about Bitcoin's fungibility. And my co-founder and I heard that and said, hey, we could code that super easy. Let's do it. Uh, so we put it in the wallet. It's in there. It's been in there. It's one of our most loved, um, most loved features. And we have some improvements planned for it, uh, making um, a variable amount of hops. So instead of just five, maybe you want 10 hops, maybe you want 20 hops. And then, you, you know, so it's variable amount. We already have uh, an improvement in the wallet today called Staggered Ricochet. And what that does is actually takes those hops and disperses them among blocks. So instead of all your hops being into one block, it will be in in various blocks, so it takes a little bit longer, but it it's, it starts to become very very difficult, very very expensive to do these analyses uh, on the Coinbase side of things. Um, so that's Ricochet, and that's a premium transaction. Users pay to do that transaction, um, and it was really the first premium transaction we put in the wallet as, and it was really to decide to determine whether users would pay for these types of things, whether they, there's a market for in, in, uh, enhanced privacy, whether users will pay to obtain basic privacy on the blockchain. And, you know, we, they will, we, we learned, they will absolutely. Yep. Uh, so they do, and they still do. Uh, so that was Ricochet. Then came um, Bit47 or Paynims, and Paynims are awesome. They're free, you know, you don't have to pay extra for these. Um, what they are is a implementation of stealth addresses in Bitcoin. Uh, so I can share you, uh, with you, my pay name, and I can share that publicly. I can put it on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever, and you can derive addresses based off of that code that I, I, I put out there. But the addresses that you derive are unique between you and me, meaning no one else can derive those addresses. No one can see those addresses. So it's a really nice way of saying, here's here's my my payment code, my pay name, send me a donation, anyone, without having to actually share a static Bitcoin address, which mm -hmm. I'm sure your listeners are aware, as soon as you do that, that's a starting point. Yeah, that's a starting point at that point. You, you know, you post on Twitter, hey, this is my Bitcoin address, send me a donation. Then I, if I'm, a, uh, I'm your adversary, I know that this address belongs to you because you told me it. And I'll keep an eye on that. I could keep an eye on that for years and years and years. And, and as soon as you re receive a donation and you send it away somewhere, I'll, I could follow that. So you want to get rid of that um, starting point. And that's what Bit47 or Paynims does. Um, yeah, and I guess I, if I could there, jump in just, we, just for, for one oh, moment, um, I love that was that was incredible to see. I didn't I didn't I don't know how recently you implemented that, but yeah, that was a, something I just heard of heard about a couple of few months ago. But um, that's uh, um, synonyms are huge are huge Devon, just as you're as you're kind of saying, you know, or I guess we we're talking a little, Absolutely. A little bit earlier about you know attribution. Um, yeah, if you have yeah, synonyms are great for um, you know reducing attribution, and that's where a lot of the coercion comes from. So yeah, um, synonyms are. Or yeah, um, critical to Vanu and obviously to you know the the cypherpunk sort of ethos too. Um, so yeah, that that's an incredible feature. Absolutely, um, an incredible feature that's in there. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that. Yeah, well, that was uh, 2016 is when we um, implemented that. So that's that. been a long time and really behind the curve. Yeah, it's been it's about the, well, it's you know it's it, it's not just you. A lot of uh, the core developers kind of shit canned it uh, when it when it came out in 2016. They said that it's unanimously discouraged for implementation. Um, so that scared off people from like other wallets from implementing it, which is ironic and funny because 
the most widely implemented uh, Bitcoin standard, I would say, is um, BIP39, which allows for uh, HD wallets, meaning you have those 12 words in your passphrase or your 24 words in your passphrase. That's BIP39. And that was unanimously discouraged for implementation as well. So, <laughs> you know, that means absolutely F all. Um, but that, it scared a lot of people uh, from even looking and exploring. And it, to us, it was just another example of um, yeah, core developers not caring about privacy and uh, much more uh, much more impetus on us as application developers to build the stuff to give users privacy because they ain't getting it from the, the core developers. Um, so so yeah i mean it's 2016 it's been it's it's been going strong there's uh over a couple hundred thousand registered pay names and those are just people that have um you know said they want to put their pay name on on the public directory uh it's like i said two hundred thousand people have done that uh so it's it's definitely a, a feature that's growing um again sparrow wallet just recently implemented it into into their product which is great and i i think a couple other wallets are talking about implementing it as well so you know we, we were early on a lot of this stuff but that doesn't matter you know uh it's 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 2022 and what matters is who's doing it now uh and the fact that it's growing is really you know really um, a good thing to see and, and it also, you know, it also serves as the basis for a lot of other stuff that we've done. Um, so I'll circle back to that, but you'll see why in a second. So the other thing to talk about is um, what we call today Stonewall. So Stonewall is a way of composing the transaction uh, in a way that doesn't or minimizes the amount of deterministic links. So really, it's like a, it's like a, a fake coin join. Right, so I want to send you Bitcoin uh, in a simple transaction, a simple spend, as we would call it. Uh, you'll have maybe one input and two outputs on on that transaction, right? So one input that I'm I'm saying this coin is going to send to to Vanu, um, and you, so on the output side, Vanu is one of them, and my change address is the other one, right? That's what a typical Bitcoin transaction looks like with Stonewall, there would be four inputs and four outputs. Vanu would be one of those outputs um, and change would be one of those outputs, but then there's two decoy outputs. Uh -huh. So it basically uh, it, 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 with a simple transaction, it's deterministic. You know um, there's the sender and the, the change and you can generally tell which is the change with you so you have deterministic links as we call them with the stone wall you don't have deterministic links anymore you have probabilistic links and you could say okay there's a 30 percent probability that this input maps to that output so it's really this the feature is all about introducing plausible deniability and doubt into analysis right because you have a hundred percent uh probability you that's a good analysis but if your probability is 30 percent, you have to put a big question mark there right and you have to do a lot more digging uh, so that's what Stonewall is. And then, <laughs> then we came up with Stonewall X2. So Stonewall X2 looks exactly like a Stonewall, works exactly like a Stonewall, but instead of it being a fake coin join with yourself, it's actually a two-person coin join with someone else. And you can't tell a Stonewall from a Stonewall X2. So since the day that we released Stonewall X2, all Stonewalls could be Stonewall X2s and all Stonewall X2s could be Stonewalls <laughs> if you're looking on the blockchain. So you don't all, so you already have a diminished amount of probability, but now you don't even know how many participants you're dealing with anymore. If it's one, if it's two, if shit, if it's three, you know, you don't know anymore. Uh, so that's a cool feature. And that wouldn't have been possible uh, without paying him a uh, bit 47, your, your pseudonym as a identity layer. Uh, so that is like kind of the foundations and that's, that's really defined how we've built the product over these, these years is brick by brick. It's foundation. Uh, and then, you know, once you have that foundation, so you have the, the ricochet, you have the, uh, UTXO management, you have the, um, built in identity layer of pain them. Um, then you can start doing these interesting and novel features where two in, uh, entities can interact with each other all through Tor, for example, uh, in the case of a Stonewall X2, 
you and your counterparty, it's all automatic. None of these things are manual that you're doing and they're doing. It's all automatic. Uh, and it's routed through Tor, encrypted through Tor. Um, wouldn't be possible without that foundation being built, you know, in 2016. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess, uh, um, at, at least with some of these things, it would have been hard to do them, you know, like, uh, you know, when, uh, when blocks were full back in 2018. So I guess the, the, low, the, uh, the, the you know, the empty mempool definitely helps for, for the coin joins and I would, I would imagine the stone walls and ricochets and such. Um, but uh, I guess uh, I'm, I'm curious, um, kind of to transition just just a little bit, but but not really. Um, I guess uh, um, could you could you provide us with I guess maybe your your general take and outlook on the Bitcoin space? I know from from my vantage point, I see uh, you know I guess you guys would call them the number go up folks. Um, there's there, there's a lot of those. There's kind of the uh, um, the the first realm assholes who are trying to incorporate you know this this great second realm money into the first realm, like uh, you know these uh, I'll just say these these billionaires. We'll just put it that way. Um, yeah. And you have, uh, you know, I guess there's obviously, you know, this this hardcore cypherpunk constituency, which is great. You got, um, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of folks in this ecosystem. But I'm just curious with with your from your vantage point, yeah. um, what's your, your general take and outlook on, on on the Bitcoin space and maybe just the, the future of, of Bitcoin privacy and and uh, you know Bitcoin's relevancy in general? Um, I guess to the first realm per se. Yeah, I mean, this is generally where I get in trouble, right? Um, because I don't, you know, I'm not a uh, a Bitcoin idealist. I don't think that, you know, Bitcoin changes the world. And I don't think that um, uh, just because Bitcoin is there, you know, there, there goes state tyranny. And, uh, you know, um, I, I got it when I got into Bitcoin, the, the primary reason I got into Bitcoin was for censorship free transactions, um, for self sovereignty and a way to route around the legacy system. And the fact that a, a a type of money, as I as I thought of it then, existed to to route around um, uh, the entrenched and, uh, aspects of the legacy system, it was amazing to me. And pretty much, I would say ninety percent of the people involved at that time were all there for that reason. Um, so privacy was was high on people's radar. Um, censorship-free transactions, ways of transacting without internet, for example, in case internet goes down. Like all of this was all on, on everyone's mind and we were all kind of working towards that that end. Um, within a few years, uh, you know, at least by 20, 2015, things had, we, the writing on the wall was there for us. Um, you started having a bunch of clowns entering the space. It was really more about investment and more about, um, uh, ultimately having a, a larger fiat stack at the end of it right and i think that totally that totally uh, perverts what this thing is about um so you know we haven't we haven't changed uh our our goals have remained the same uh what we're trying to do has remained the same and um we are realistic when asked about, you know, kind of other tools or what do you think about, you know, for example, Lightning Network, this and that. Um, we're realistic about it and we, we, we say what's on our mind and I, I end up getting in trouble uh, a lot because of that. But, um, you know, that type of thing, the, uh, the Lightning Network in, in particular, to me is a, a capture event for Bitcoin. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to end up being, if it becomes successful at all, which is not a given, it's going to be a very permissioned layer. Um, anyone who's, who's building services on Lightning Network today will be money transmitters of the future and will have to submit to the state's authority. Um, and, and uh, you know, for that reason, we've had no interest in it and we've warned against it and say, look, we're, this is, in our view, malinvestment. You're investing in, in something development wise and building services wise. That um, that may scale technically, uh, but socially does not, and it's going to be it's it's the chains that are going to choke us out. Um, so no, I, you know I don't have a lot of high hopes for the overall trajectory of the Bitcoin um, project. I see it going. Uh, well, I think the capture is in already. I think that's too late to avoid at this point. Um, what I do have hope for are the remnant communities. Um, and I would consider Samurai and our users in that, that group. Um, I have a lot of faith there. And as you know, I'm sure, 
uh, black and gray markets are the largest markets uh, in the world, mm -hmm. uh, more so than white markets, absolutely. And um, in the shadows, we will um, we will thrive. And you know, we don't and have never wanted to aim for mass adoption because mass adoption is the poison pill. That's how yeah. they get you. Uh, what we will what we will do is make sure that the software that we we write and the software that we publish um, serves. A, a niche and uh if you need it it will be there right and that's what the best that that's the best thing that we can say uh if you need censorship free transactions if you need privacy if you and everyone does but if you realize you need it i should say mm -hmm. then you'll be able to find it we'll be there because we're you know we, we're writing the software for this uh, and that's the most I can say about it. Um, I, I think this this recent downturn in price uh, ex has exposed a lot of these charlatans who have sold Bitcoin as some sort of number go up technology, as some sort of savings tech, as some sort of inflation hedge. And it's like, dude, it's software. You know, it's none of those things. It hasn't done any of those jobs. But what it does do, it can do really well. You just have to sell it and be true uh, to what it what this thing actually is. And um, today it still works and it will work if it's a hundred dollars or work if it's a thousand dollars or work if it's a hundred thousand dollars. It works if you know what you're, if you're trying to achieve with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that's definitely true. Um, that, that's definitely true. And that's been a realization I've had, or I guess just more, more development per se, but um, yeah, that I, I, I realized like I, I didn't want to deal with bank institutions anymore. And, um, you know, Bitcoin has started to become it started becoming a bigger and bigger part um, trying to transition out um, of, of the first realm. Like, I, I'm just like it's it, and that yeah, the, you, the way that you put that was per, that was perfect. Um, you know, Bitcoin is a great tool to route around the legacy systems, the first realm, the survival society, whatever you want to call it. Um, Absolutely. It's, uh, it's great for that. And, and, the, and the comment I will make. Uh, so, so you are right that it's kind of it's kind of going negatively in, in many areas. Um, but but I guess it, it, but also um, like and I've mentioned these examples a number of times um, as of late. But um, like with uh, with ghost phone, with privacy phones, the, the, the user friendliness of those um, coming around. Um, yes. J like just Jitsi, like this peer to peer encrypted um, messaging. I used I used Jitsi back in like 2016 and it was not easy to use. Um, it took like a number like <laughs> yeah. steps to even get to this point where we're at right now. Um, so. So, yeah, I know um, it's so easy now. <laughs> so it's. So yeah, like there are, there are obviously some some negative kind of Babylon type uh, type type surveillance tools being built, but at the same time, um, for for those of us who are looking for solutions outside of the first realm, looking for ways to route around, um, there will always be solutions. You know, just just got to get creative and yes, and and, 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 and it's still viable, absolutely for that. It's still viable for that, and and you know that's why we're so um, so vocal, um, you know, about anything that might detract. Uh, from that, you know, any anything that might like so, for example, when Wasabi made their declaration of blacklist, like that's a huge attack. That's yeah. a huge, huge attack, and you have to be vocal about it. You have to say no, this isn't okay. And and we've been warning, like I mean, warning about Wasabi since like 2019, and we yeah. focus solely on the fact that you know the coin join itself wasn't good. The the fact that you could make these links, the fact that you know you could determine um if, if you, you came in with a large amount you could very easily see that you know who that was on the mix -in. so we were it was all technicals it was all specifics and you know it was my naivety to say well if we show them blockchain proof which you really can't argue with then they'll 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 understand they'll believe and that wasn't the case because most people i learned can't don't know how to look at the blockchain at all you mm -hmm. know so i was showing them irrefutable blockchain evidence that you know you can't argue with but someone would argue with it and it just became a social kind of argument and was, okay fine but it, it took so we that was 2019 2020 2021 i kind of shut up on in 2021 i said you look i you guys i've said everything i have to say like this is a a clusterfuck of a of coin join and then finally they come up with this statement and that the community understands right like that Pretty much everyone understood uh, whether you agreed with it or not. It became very clear. Okay, they're blacklisting, and yeah, I was very happy that finally people said, "Hey, that's not right. That's not cool." Uh, so you, you know, it's important to be vocal about these things. But we we knew that 
if Bitcoin was going to be successful in the long term, it would be captured. Uh, what we had hoped is that we had enough time to shore up our defenses on the protocol side to make that capture event less, um, you know, less of a problem, right? So we were hoping in 2015 that we would have confidential transactions, for example, on the protocol side of things. We would have uh, various other privacy enhancing um, BIPs be approved and coded. That ended up never happening. And we ended up with that first kind of major, um, you know, price spike over a thousand that set everything off, you know, the, I guess that was in 2013 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And from that point, privacy took on the back, was put on the back burner from the, on a protocol uh, point of view, uh, you know, and then you had the spam, the network spam, the full blocks of 2015, 2016, 2017. Um, that was spam. That wasn't network activity. Yep. That was an entity spamming the blockchain, <laughs> which, which we, again, provided creating lots of a, creating, proof about, creating lots of evidence. For lightning network. I guess would probably be No, it, well, it wasn't for the lightning. It wasn't for the lightning network. It was actually for, um, bigger blocks. Well, yeah. So well, yeah, this entity, yeah. this, right. So this was the time when we were, there was all the splits happening. You had Bitcoin, uh, before Bitcoin cash, you had SegWit, uh, 2x or whatever you had bitcoin abc you had all these splits right. occurring to go for bigger blocks but there was the, the demand wasn't there and whoever this entity was wanted to create the demand uh and they, you know they they jammed up the network for months and months and months it was very it, it was very expensive to transact um slow etc what this ended up doing though was putting a, a focus on the need to scale the network. And this is where lightning network came right, from. Yeah. It came around this time. And, you know, so, it, and what we warned at the time was, look, it's too early. You don't have to worry about this right now. Um, that demand isn't real. You will need it. We will need to figure this <laughs> out. We will need to figure out second layers, but right now we don't have to, right now we need to focus on privacy. Yeah. Um, but so all of that development talent and they are talented developers all of that development talent went towards lightning network went towards scaling went toward this and that well once that <laughs> once that uh spam attack ended well you've seen there has been empty mempool pretty much all the time you know and that second layer has actually ended up being the alts and being permissioned and being this and that it what hasn't gone into lightning it hasn't gone into Bitcoin. In fact, it's gone into Ethereum and various other stupid, uh, you know, chains. Um, so there was a malinvestment at the time. And what I had hoped at that time was that we would have had more time to shore up the defenses uh, on the protocol side of things, but we didn't. And it was at that point we decided, look, application developers are more important than ever. If it's not going to be on the protocol layer, we have to provide an application to users to obtain these basic levels of privacy. Um, and that's really what it came down to. And I, and I, that was long and rambling, I'm sorry. Oh, you're, you're um, but the, the point is, yeah, the point is like, if you wanna opt out, if you wanna get around the legacy system, you can do it with Bitcoin. It's very viable, it's very possible. Uh, I'm not gonna say it's incredibly easy, uh, but nothing worth doing is easy. Uh, but it's possible and that's enough. You know, the fact that there is an escape hatch is, well, it's a blessing, man, really. Yeah, agreed, um, agreed. So uh, we've been going for about an hour and I guess there's just a couple other things I'd like to, uh, a couple of things I'd like to work in here real quick. And one of those I feel like would be remiss if we didn't at least mention this part, um, kind of the self-hosted aspect of this. Um, but people just like for me, um, I'm just connecting to uh, Whirlpool um, I'm connecting to your guys' mm -hmm. servers. I don't have my um, I don't have my my setup here yet, where I have my full node, unfortunately. So I am um, connecting to um, your guys' node. Um, but there is uh, I know there's the, there's the Ronin Dojo, um, and uh, I guess could, could yep. you speak to I guess um, um, I guess uh, I mean, I know there's not any there's not any risk. I, 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 I guess, well, I guess I can't really say that, but from what from what I've heard. But um, could you talk a little bit about uh, I guess uh, the safety of people connecting to yeah, Whirlpool with absolutely. Their yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, 
at its most simple for your listeners to understand, um, if you don't have your own node in your own house uh, connected to your own internet, downloading your own blocks, then you're relying on someone else's node. I mean, that's that's obvious, right? Um, now, what exactly does that mean for you? Uh, well, for a Samurai Wallet user, what it means is that Samurai Wallet servers are talking to your wallet and saying that your wallet has this number of Bitcoin in it, and this is the trans transaction history associated with it. So all of this is public information on the blockchain, but the risk for you as someone who isn't using your own node is that Samurai Wallet knows that these transactions and these um, UTXOs belong to your wallet. Now that's mitigated on our end with one Tor, meaning the IP address that you query our servers with will be masked. And two, the fact that we don't actually ask her any identifying information. We don't ask her a name or an email address or anything at all. And we don't collect anything like a, a phone uh, ID or serial number, or anything like that. Uh, so you can connect to the server anonymously through Tor and retrieve your information. Now, some users, a lot of users, that's completely fine. That's within their, um, you know, their threat model. They're not worried about Samurai Wallet uh, knowing that this wallet um, contains these UTXOs and these transactions. But for some users, that's not an acceptable part of their threat model. So what they're able to do is run their own node and their own Samurai server infrastructure on top of that node that their wallet will communicate with instead of our servers. Uh, so the Ronin, the Ronin Dojo node is probably the best one. Well, it's definitely the best one out there. Um, whether you buy the actual hardware from them or you just use the software that they develop you, uh, on your own hardware, um, it makes it incredibly easily. It's kind of just a, a plug and play type of thing where a node will be set up, the server excuse me, the server stuff will be set up, and all you have to do is connect your wallet on your Android to this by scanning a QR code. Uh, at that point, you're no longer relying on any infrastructure that isn't hosted by you. Um, from a privacy perspective, there really, uh, again, isn't a huge trade-off by using our servers because we don't know who you, who you are. We don't KYC AML. You don't know your name or your email address, and you're probably using Tor uh, to connect to our servers. Uh, so it really just comes down to where you are in your journey. And uh, you know, I, I think it'd be it would be silly to expect someone who's just getting into Bitcoin, just kind of understanding Bitcoin privacy, to have to you know run a node uh, in order to use the best in class privacy tools. Doesn't make sense to me. So. Uh, the threat model is going to be different for each person. And as you learn, as you progress, I think it's like an aspirational thing. Like, okay, I know how to do coin joins. I know how to do, you know, ricochets. I know how to do this. Now it's time for me to run my own node and be completely self-sovereign. So I recommend everyone run their own node. Uh, everyone use their own, their own hardware, but when the time is right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. I would certainly not recommend someone forego. Uh, world pulling their Bitcoin because they don't have their own node. That's silly. Um, yeah, I would definitely. Yeah, a lot of that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. But the, the, there's some people out there who are who are literally arguing for that, and it's like, you know, do you not understand that the tracks you leave behind on the blockchain are there for life? That is immutable. It will always be there. So you should do everything you can to avoid leaving tracks in the public blockchain regardless of how you interact with the blockchain, whether it be by your own node or someone else's node, mm -hmm. because someone you interacting with someone else's node isn't being put on the blockchain. That's just a query to a server, right? Versus you making a transaction that deterministically links your Coinbase purchase to your dark web purchase is insane. Right. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so yes, use Whirlpool, use the tools, even if you don't have your own node running, but work towards that because, and I'm sure your listeners are all in the camp where they want to be self-sovereign fully. And that's, a, that's the step to get there. Like you do need to run your own node to be self-sovereign in a, in a full manner. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, 
So, um, great man. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I, I, I definitely agree. So, I guess the last thing I want to mention, and something I didn't have in my outline initially, but it, it came to mind. Uh, I guess it would have been probably like two or three years ago. I interviewed Richard Myers, who was um, who I wor did work oh, with yeah. Go Tenor or TX Tenor. And I, I recall now, I think you guys uh, you guys did some work with TX Tenor. So, I guess could you talk a little bit about um, yes. I guess some of that work and off grid Bitcoin? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we developed TX Tena. It was a joint uh, project with Go Tena. Uh, so we did the software side of things on um, creating the application uh, that would interface with the Go Tena mesh device. And we have um, uh, hooked up into the actual Samurai wallet itself the ability to broadcast your transactions through a mesh network uh, via Go Tena. Um, if your wallet's in offline mode. So if you don't have an internet connection, you can still open your wallet, you can still compose a transaction. And if you have a GoTenna mesh device, you could broadcast that transaction using that particular GoTenna mesh device. Um, it was primarily a proof of concept. You know, again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of our early interests was in censorship resistance. And the, the thought process was, okay, let's say internet goes down or internet is censored. Um, Bitcoin ports are censored, something happens, some event um, happens where it's not uh, feasible to be able to use the internet uh, to access your Bitcoin and, and spend your Bitcoin. Well, what could, you know, what user, what options does the user have? So TX Tena was just kind of an initial foray into, into that kind of uh, idea. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. And I actually, uh, um, I didn't, I didn't try intently, but um, I, I actually would love to, I don't know what Richard's doing now, but um, I would like to, to talk about the off-grid Bitcoin space. That was a fun episode. Um, very, very. Uh, um, yeah. Rich is a great guy. Yeah. Smart guy. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, indeed. So I guess uh, the, the last thing, and it's just kind of a, a general question to close out. Um, so uh, you've been in the, in the Bitcoin and privacy realms for some time, and uh, I presume the realm of liberation necessarily too. Um, I guess uh, any tips or advice you'd be willing to share for uh, the Venuans or self liberators listening, uh, whether pertaining to Bitcoin or not? Um, well, goodness. Um, when it relates relating to Bitcoin, uh, read, read, read. Uh, check out our, our documentation site, uh, docs.samurai.io. There's a lot of information there, not necessarily just about Samurai Wallet, but about transactional privacy and basic uh basic blockchain heuristics and such. Uh, so read, learn, uh, understand how, what tracks you're leaving behind when you make a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. That's really the best way to understand how the Bitcoin blockchain works and making it and being able to make an informed uh, decision when you're, when you're transacting and, you know, outside of Bitcoin, I think that, uh, the, the best advice I can think of just off the top of my head right now is uh, don't be a fence sitter, you know, uh, take a position on something, take a position on things and and do whatever it is that you need to do to to reach that level that you want to reach, you know, um, walking the line and fence sitting. We're way past that at the, in 2022. Um, no one's going to give you uh, freedom. No one's going to give you liberty. You have to take it and you have to you have to do it yourself. Uh, and with like-minded people and like your community. Uh, so, so, you know, don't be afraid, uh, take precautions, take protections, but, but don't put it off, you know, uh, do everything you can to, to get to that point that you want to get to, whether it's self-sovereign or whether it's just being able to, to get by without a government, uh, sanctioned bank account, <laughs> you know, or whether it's you making a, a, a foray into the Bitcoin space and earning in Bitcoin or some other. Uh, crypto or whatever, you know, uh, just take those steps and, and don't hesitate because that's that's where death lies. Yes, yes, uh, agreed, man, hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on. This was a, a fantastic conversation. I knew I knew I would enjoy it. Um, just from hearing those, uh, I, I only I guess I only heard a few interviews with you before, but um, but it was uh, um, hearing hearing about the I guess the cypherpunk kind of mobile business model um, and, and some other things. I resonate a lot more with uh, it resonate a lot more with um, with you than I have with with some some uh, some I guess uh, with some of what I heard from Wasabi. So um, yeah, and now from talking to you, I can confirm that. So yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on, and again, I appreciate all your work in, in Bitcoin privacy over the years. Um, it's, uh, yeah, you've, you've, uh, you've definitely, My pleasure, helped, man. you've definitely helped a lot of people. And I mean, I, I, I can't, I can't foresee, um, 
where the realm of Bitcoin privacy would be if you guys were out here doing it for the past six plus years or so, um, however long it's been. Um, yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be in a good place. It'd be even in, even in, in more dire states. So, um, yeah, I know I'm appreciate. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I and I, I appreciate that uh, uh, truly, and thank you for you know inviting me on and 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 really you know we we build the software, we publish the software, we put it out there, but uh, it's the community. And I'm sure you know that uh, having a community of your own, it's the community that that really makes or breaks something. And the samurai community is is not something that I ever foresaw when we started this project. Um, and it's just it's humbling and it's a wonderful thing to experience and see. Uh, these guys are so helpful. They're all there for their own self interest, but they're they're there to help. And uh, and they're a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of information for for. Uh, new users and experienced users alike. So join up in our Telegram if you're interested at all. Uh, Samurai Wallet. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Just whatever. Uh, talk to our, our our guys because they're. I mean they're super cool and they they want to help you. And they want to get you to the point that you want to get to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Very good. So there's the uh, there's a Telegram. I know and I need to watch these myself. I haven't done it yet. There's that video series uh, that 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 oh, video yeah. series that came out that I'm gonna I'm gonna link in here. Um, that the people should go check out, uh, and then I, I guess is there any other any other resources or places you want to send people? No, that, I think that's perfect. I mean, I think anyone starting at that that video series, which is the Bitcoin privacy uh, mm -hmm. series, yeah, that's an awesome place to start. There's, um, I think, there's seven videos there. They're all under ten minutes long. They're really easy to understand and digest. And when you're done with it. Uh, with those those videos, you will have a really firm grasp on the basics of, of Bitcoin transactions and chain analysis and how to use um, the tools that are out there to to audit your own transactions. And you'll have a really good understanding of it. So I highly, highly recommend that. I'm really happy to hear you're going to put the link there. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Awesome, Samurai. Well, thank you so much. And uh, um, yeah, if uh, you ever got any new, uh, I guess, new features on the wall, you want to get out to people, let me know. I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, to help get the good word out, get, help awesome. get the good word out on privacy stuff. So um, appreciate it again. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, guys. And there you have it. Co-founder of Samurai Wallet uh, at Samurai Wallet on Twitter. Uh, I do highly recommend you download the wallet and uh, give it a go. Uh, I'm obviously a big fan, uh, and Whirlpool is kind of an addiction now. Uh, I get excited anytime I get to coin join Bitcoin. It's kind of strange. Uh, it's a, str a strange addiction, but I guess there's worse ones to have. Um, anyway, we do have some upcoming events here at the Free Republic of Pasnia. Uh, Anarchy Day weekend is next up, uh, taking place from July 1st to July 4th. Uh, September 1st to 5th to the uh, 5th is uh, Agorism Day weekend, and uh, Vanu Fest 3, our week-long gathering of liberation, happens from September 26th uh, to October 3rd. Um, and uh, all, as always, yeah, please note, only vetted self liberators are permitted entry. Um, that is, uh, I must uh, know and invite you personally, or we have to have a colleague in common uh, willing to vouch for you. Uh, and if you need help getting vetted, uh, just send me an email, shane at libertyunderattack.com. Uh, send me a message on Telegram, or uh, come out to the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest uh, and meet Ora and I in person. Uh, if we get a good feel about you, uh, you might just get an invite. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, uh, please do keep a lookout for the newly redesigned Pazni website. Uh, I've got a great start on it, uh, but still have a number of pages to add. Um, but it's much better, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, lastly, as always, please do check out Libertarian Tech Publications uh, for books and strategy guides in the realm of uh, Bonnie and self-liberation, uh, ghost pads, ghost phones, and other privacy tools, and uh, the newest edition, uh, Wars Apothecary. Uh, that website is libertarianattack.com, and uh, use coupon code SELFLIBERATE for 15% off an order of books. Um, I think that's all for now. Uh, so thanks, guys. Uh, always remember, Vonu is yours for the making. And uh, yeah, coin joining your Bitcoin is an act of love. Uh, until next time. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this 
does if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do um, if you can't communicate especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point if you can't communicate without being monitored it basically hamstrings anything you know anything going forward step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone again libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone and make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads privacy tools freedom boxes and more libertyunderattack.com is the website liberty under attack publications share your story find your freedom Vanu means relative physical invulnerability to coercion. Vanu is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vanu. Coercion includes murder, mayhem, slavery, robbery, rape, extortion, pollution, any physical interference with peaceful activities of another, whether by individuals or organizations. Coercion, especially institutionalized forms such as war, regimentations, and taxes, is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past attempts at solution have been top-down efforts to change society as a whole. Since the days of Babylon, there have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. At most, such efforts bring temporary relief. Usually they have little effect. Often, they make matters worse. Vanu life represents a different approach to the problem. Vanu life does not waste space scolding government officials or proclaiming how society ought to be. Vanu life speaks to you as an individual or small group and suggests ways you can avoid exploiting and being exploited. As you reduce the vulnerability, not only do you help yourself, indirectly you also help others by decreasing support of criminal institutions. Vanu is not necessarily only a few. Vanu will expand as there are more people willing to do. A Vanuan is a person who has achieved relative invulnerability to coercion. There are many kinds. Some live in the wilderness, where outsiders rarely go. Others live under the earth. Others move from place to place, living in vans, campers, buses, boats, or tents. Some have been Vanu for ages, people such as gypsies, mountain men, hobos, seminoles. Others are recent refugees from the dying cities. This issue describes some of the equipment and techniques used. In future issues, I hope you'll add your knowledge to what is in here. Vanu life. How to live and let live. Out of sight and minds of those unwilling to let live. By people who are doing it. To order your paperback copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Or to download this publication for free, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash VL.